our guest speakers here a, a minute to get a quick bite to eat. They've, they're on sort of a whirlwind trip down from D.C., uh, flew in just uh, a few hours ago this morning. Actually, they landed, I guess, just over an hour and a half ago, and then they're flying back out uh, in not more than about two hours from now, so we'll at least give them the, uh, a chance to get a quick bite. But uh, we're really happy to welcome Dr. Bob Cadleck and Dr. David Marcosi here uh, as part of our conference. Um, Dr. Cadleck is a retired Air Force colonel. He served previously as the White House Director of Bio, Bio Defense Preparedness and Response uh, of the Homeland Security Council, and is now the Staff Director of the Senate Subcommittee on Bioterrorism and Public Health, which is chaired by North Carolina's own Senator Burr. Uh, Dr. Marcosi is a Doctor of Emergency Medicine, actually here at Duke, um, but he is currently serving as a U.S. Congressional Fellow in Washington, and he is an expert on uh, military and disaster medicine. So we have two doctors here, um, I think both intrepid souls for standing here at the law school in front of a room full of law professors and aspiring, uh, aspiring lawyers, and also somewhat doubly intrepid given some of the, the topics that we've discussed this morning, uh, which you know, quite honestly have been somewhat critical of um, congressional initiatives and legislative response to disasters. And uh, the work that they're involved in on the committee is um, you know, along the lines of what Professor DePorter had to say this morning, is the kind of work that, if done properly, is the kind of work you never hear about at all because it's you know, planning for disasters appropriately. So in, in that respect, I think it can be a thankless job. Um, but I, I do think it makes a nice connection with the type of things we've been talking about. The, these are the folks on Capitol Hill who are doing, doing the work that, uh, that sort of describes the things that we've talked a bit about this morning. So without any further ado, Dr. Cadillac, thank you. Thank you, James. Well, well thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come down here today. I'll tell you, it is a great pleasure to be here at Duke. Uh, I know it's kind of a sad day for you all after the events last night. I watched it myself. Uh, <clears throat> but it is kind of... Uh, Again, uh, reassuring to get out, if you will, outside the beltway of Washington to kind of, if you will, hear some of the debate, and I was fortunate to catch a few minutes of the previous discussion and presentation, to again, again, appreciation of where, if you will, the tip of the spear is or the action as it relates to, to many of these issues. Uh, we are the, have the good fortune to actually have uh, Dave Marcosi with us as a congressional fellow, and again, who represents uh, Duke uh, very well, but again, our, our, pardon me, our effort to reach out um, to probably get some of the best and the brightest as it relates to the areas that I'll be talking about today, and that is public health and emergency preparedness as we go forward. When I took this job uh, about a year ago, uh, I had retired from the service. I had spent three years in the White House. <clears throat> I was uh, decided I would take 60 days off uh, to kind of walk around my house in fuzzy slippers and chasing my uh, six-year-old twins. Uh, and I got a call out of the blue from Senator Burr's office and said, uh, would you like to consider coming down and working for me? And I met with a senator, a great guy. And, um, and we started off on this, what I would call an intrepid journey uh, back in April of 2005 that predates Katrina, that predates the pandemic influenza uh, concern, uh, and then kind of wound up in the middle of this uh, uh, if you will, tornado, uh, its own disaster up on uh, Capitol Hill, to address many of these issues in real time. Uh, the one thing I will say as a caveat, uh, and Jamie was kind enough to point out that I am a physician. Uh, I do not play a lawyer on TV or any other capacity in my life. I'm good, fortunate that I have uh, good counsel uh, up on the Hill. Uh, but also, I think if Senator Burr was here, you would find that he's not only better looking, but a lot smarter than I am. And he does regret that he couldn't be here personally because this is a passion to him. And I'm one of the reasons I am here today, not only uh, working for Senator Burr, but here at Duke, is uh, sharing that passion with him and his vision of what we're trying to do, which is, again, in a perfect world, is trying to prepare for disasters that hopefully will never happen, but do so in a manner that tries to move in the best, the best fashion to get the right policy and put it in the right legislation and try to insulate it from the political pressures that, quite frankly, have gotten pretty severe uh, here recently as a result of, of some of the events, particularly Katrina. I would like to just kind of just uh, 
spend a moment with you, and, and I have to give you a, a caveat. Since I am dealing with a non-medical audience, I figured I would share some pearls of wisdom as it relates to the practice of medicine, uh, because I think it's important that we kind of establish cross-cultural communication. And, and I'll use a, an observation by David Letterman that says, be suspicious of any doctor who tries to take your temperature with his finger. Uh, so when I talk about legislation here today, um, I do so as, a, if you will, an active participant in this, but certainly not an expert as it deals with all the intricacies of the legislative process. But I would like to give you, if you will, start at the grandest level, if you will, at the strategy level, the national strategic level, and then actually highlight those things that we're currently working on to give you some flavor for some of the nuanced policy issues that we're, just, we're encountering and addressing, as well as some of the clearly direct legal issues we've touched on and will touch on as we go through this process. The second, I just want to highlight that the Biodefense Pandemic Vaccine and Drug Development Act, S1873, is a bill that was introduced in October of uh, 2005. It's a product of Senator Burr. Uh, that deals with trying to, if you will, improve the, the availability of medical countermeasures for, for emergency use. That emergency may be deliberate, accidental, or natural. And the second, if you will, the third bullet item here talks about what we're trying to do to reauthorize the Bioterrorism Act of 2002, which is set to expire this fall, which has a lot to do how we conduct our public health preparedness and medical pre preparedness in the country. I would just like to maybe diverge just a moment to spend a few minutes about the nature of the threat. I'm going to talk specifically about the deliberate threat from bioterrorism, but I think you can apply it more broadly to the deliberate threat as it relates to chemical, nuclear, radiological events. And quite frankly, and this is drawn from the President's directive that was signed in April 2004, that I was, if you will, the principal manager of during my tenure at the White House. But to highlight just a couple things that really, I think, highlight some of the challenges I think legalistically you'll have to deal with. One of them is, is that, you know, in a deliberate biological attack, short of, an, you know, powder coming in the mail like the anthrax attack, may mimic a natural disease occurrence. So in some ways, the first identification of an event will be, if you will, sick people, but it will be responded, if you will, detected and responded to by local and maybe state officials. And yet it will be something that will quickly rise within the hours of realization to a national level, literally to the president, if it were to be recognized as deliberate or potentially deliberate. And that will invoke a whole series of things, not only from a public health standpoint, but also from a, if you will, legalistic and criminal, criminal investigation standpoint that will bring in the FBI and a variety of other federal partners uh, to, your, to your locale. I just note that North Carolina uh, was the recipient of such uh, probably uninvited <laughs> attention uh, back in 2001 as a result of the anthrax letter attacks when the first individual uh, presented or actually became sick while he was vacationing uh, in western North Carolina. And the center of the initial epidemiological investigation and criminal investigation were centered out of this state. Uh, the other thing that you, I think, need to realize, and again, I'm not going to spend too much time here, is that this issue of the numbers of people that may be affected by a biological event, clearly if you are if you've followed this issue and you look at the potential for let's say an anthrax an open air anthrax attack it could put at risk several million people um, uh, very easily in fact given the proper meteorological conditions and then when you talk about communicable diseases such as smallpox potentially pandemic influenza then you get into this issue of not only inter intrastate interstate and nationally and internationally that raises a whole host of other additional uh, both public health and legal issues. Now what's really going to make this problem, I guess, spicier over time is that we are on the cusp of what I would say revolutionary changes in biotechnology today. Uh, I think you may recall some of the um, issues that were raised ethically by, if you will, the synthetic uh, construction of a polio virus at State, uh, State, of Univer State University of New York and Stony Brook. 
but there have been a number of, if you will, further events that only galvanized the belief that synthetic biology, the ability to create viruses de novo, or potentially even bacteria de novo in the near future, where you can actually have hybrids of these particular things. Just think what would happen if you crossed smallpox with Ebola with Marburg, for example. That in the not too distant future, we're going to have another layer of complexity to this problem as it relates to the possibility that not only will nation states have this ability, not only will terrorists, if you will, biologists turn terrorists will have this issue uh, opportunity, but the circumstance that we face with the Unabomber may be something more near term than we even believed, and that is the fact that you may have an individual, a highly qualified, highly educated individual with access to information and some technology, and I highlight the information part of it here, that will be able to perpetrate uh, devastating events. I think uh, Josh Litterberg, a Nobel laureate, said, you know, in the near future, a biological buffoon can kill 100,000 people. And that was kind of like the nature of the consideration as we looked at the, uh, if you will, the development of our policy. I only show you this is because this is the framework we actually use to make this <coughs> national policy for the president. And I'll go into some of the details very briefly. But we looked at it holistically that there is a continuum of, a, if you will, of functions that drive across a potential WMD event. And I would say generalize this further to a pandemic event if it were to be pandemic flu. Because this, this approach is actually was adopted, adapted to the pandemic threat that we now face. And individual, if you will, functional areas identified on the top, but a series of cross-cutting issues as they relate to, the, to all the issues across. And I, you can barely see it, but very important to this is the public preparedness piece, which raises some very interesting issues as it relates to what's appropriate to expect from the public, what can you realistically uh, inform them of, and then how can you hold, if you will, state and local authorities accountable for that, for that requirement. And then the people issue here is not necessarily uh, the public, but is really the fact that the, the fact that there are a number of specialized individuals that are needed to populate this area, and they range from the, the mundane public health professionals that work in their local county public health department onto the element of, if you will, highly trained, skilled virologists, microbiologists, and the like. So there is a, a variety of things, and again, this is a challenge that we're going to face in the 21st century that is not going to get any easier soon. The president's policy, nice shiny cover, of course. Uh, but I just want to spend a moment to talk that the, the spectrum of activity here ranges from, if you will, these four principal pillars, threat awareness, prevention and protection, surveillance and detection, response and recovery. And I'll highlight a couple of them. First of all, uh, there is a little bit of issue of intelligence I only highlight what the WMD Commission, uh, the National Commission on Weapons of Mass Destruction reported to the President that said that the biological weapons threat is difficult now and will become more so in the future. And again, largely because what we know now is very little and what we'll know in the future will be less as it relates to the proliferation of biotechnology and the fact that it can be used by a variety of states, groups, and individuals for harmful purposes. The other issue is here that's important is this idea of anticipation of threats, and I touched on that in a moment. I just want to focus on one issue here that I think is of, of importance, I think, to the legal community, more so from the standpoint of, if you will, the, the criminal investigation of any kind of biological event. I highlight this issue that potentially would be difficult to discriminate between a natural and a deliberate event should it happen, particularly if it started as a small scale event. Um, very limited in focus, geography, and number of individuals involved. But I'll just highlight to you today, almost four years after the fact, or five years after the fact, excuse me, that we still have not determined who conducted the anthrax litter attacks. Um, that is a major, major vulnerability as it relates to a public policy uh, approach to the threat of this problem. Because unless you can tell who done it, you can't deter against threats like these, particularly from states or individuals even, or specific actors. So the fact that we have a vulnerability in our, our technical and, if you will, investigatory attribution approach to this problem 
remains what I would consider the Achilles heel uh, for our future. You will see that as you look across this, that the preponderance of issues raised here happen to fall on, if you will, the right-hand side of this continuum, if, if you will. And this is, if you will, a very, I would say, a stark kind of acknowledgement of the fun fundamental vulnerability of our intelligence system to reliably to collect information, intelligence about states, groups, and individuals, witness Iraq, to understand what the nature of the potential biological threat is, and it also recognizes that probably the most important thing that we have to invest in today is this issue of attack warning, which puts us in an interesting position as it relates to disease surveillance. And that really is something that's been highlighted with a program that was created by the Centers for Disease Control called Biosense, which is attempting to basically data mine patient records in a way that would permit, if you will, early recognition of, if you will, individual events or clusters of events uh, in major metropolitan areas around the country. But again, it pushes on some of these issues. I'm not saying this is like the NSA wiretapping or anything, but clearly pushes on a domain as it relates to patient privacy that clearly has uh, very important civil liberty as well as patient privacy issues. I only go from this to maybe a vision of where we're directed to go, and I only point out that Senator Bill Frist beat Senator Byrd just by a little bit, putting his vision out first. But I only highlight this is because this is kind of, if you will, an approach that we're taking or trying to take, a comprehensive approach informed by the national strategy, I think focusing more on the, some of the granular pieces of this, of establishing, if you will, a comprehensive, uniform approach, if you will, soup to nuts, to deal with the threat of natural, accidental, and deliberate uh, biological events, as well as chemical, radiological, and nuclear. The, the, the byword here is all hazard, if you will. Now, this was the start of our effort as it related to last summer and spring, and quite frankly has been energized by the events of Katrina that highlighted, again, the, the potential for natural catastrophes. So what we're trying to do is, if you will, put our arms entirely around if you will, this, these disparate events whose only uniform characteristic is basically drawing or, if you will, demanding from a very fragile public health and medical infrastructure of the nation to deal with a variety of things that, quite frankly, uh, make your head hurt uh, when you think about the potential between a 10K, 10 kiloton nuclear detonation, maybe in New York and or in Washington, near simultaneously, to the point of multiple anthrax attacks that would put potentially tens of, tens of millions of Americans at risk, or at least would think to be at risk from that, to the far end of the spectrum to a pandemic influenza event where, at least by some conservative calculations, 90 million Americans would be afflicted by pandemic influenza and somewhere between uh, a third, maybe a half, could potentially succumb to its effects. So this is no small, I would say, challenge. Uh, but I only highlighted that it is uh, that is something that we're we're really engaging on seriously. I'm going to basically kind of loop back a little bit to the first slide, talk about threats, to talk about something that we did, if you will, draft as legislation, and will likely well will be reintroduced as a bill uh, next week, uh, Monday or Tuesday, that deals with one element, an important element of our ability to respond to events, and that is, if you will, drug development, uh, drug and vaccine development, I should say. I only use this slide to highlight the fact that, again, when we talk about one of the critical pieces, and if you remember that continuum slide, that medical countermeasures was highlighted as a discrete issue here, and I'll go through the particulars why, is that unless you have some discrete means to deal with a potential event, and I'll give you an example with H5N1, that if we don't have vaccine, vaccines, or Tamiflu, or Relenza, or an antiviral drugs, that we're basically left with 19th century public health means to try to limit the spread uh, and manage an event of that, and that is through quarantine, isolation, and the like. Uh, again, there are a variety of authorities out there, and, and we'll 
loop back to talk about quarantine and isolation maybe a little, on, little later on, and maybe you'll have a few questions on that. But quite frankly, in our mobile society, in our kind of society, in our culture, the notion of being able to enforce quarantine, to enforce isolation, uh, is problematic. As someone in a major metropolitan told me one time, we don't have enough police, National Guardsmen, uh, or even vigilantes to enforce something that would be of this magnitude in light of a pandemic, a pandemic flu event. I will talk a minute here just about BioShield because this was a legislation that was signed by the President in 2004, July 2004, that really focused on trying to ensure that we had a dedicated pot of money to uh, purchase a variety of chemical, biological, radionuclear countermeasures for the nation, part of the strategic national stockpile. I'm going to kind of digress a little bit to talk a little bit about the, the nature of that process, which is less about public health, more about business, and some about the legal issues that surround the, the process by which we develop vaccines and drugs for the purpose of dealing with epidemics, pandemics, and potential uh, deliberate attacks. The point of this is, is that the U.S. government basically took $5.6 billion uh, to fund, if you will, a variety of countermeasures that would be used in the event of a potential attack. I'll give you a couple examples. One is prior to BioShield, we spent a billion dollars basically to ensure that we have enough smallpox vaccine for every man, woman, and child in America. I should, I should just leave you with the thought that you will not find your name written on one of those vials by any, by any means. But the point is, is that they have stockpiled over 300 million doses of that vaccine, uh, which is an important thing because of the communicability of that particular pathogen. But the $5.6 billion is over a 10-year window. And if you quickly do the math, that's not a lot of money when you consider that it costs about a billion dollars to develop a particular drug or vaccine in its total cost. About $800 million, to be quite frank with you. But we evaluated this. This went into, into uh, process. And the point is, is that while this looked at the procurement part of it, it didn't look how we did the business, if you will, of making vaccines and drugs. And so what I'm going to do is just kind of walk through with you um, a simplistic model that we developed and again, simplistic because uh, uh, maybe we work on Capitol Hill, and it has to be simplistic because of just uh, the nature of the business up there. But I think it highlights, if you will, the complexity of the problem when you try to incentivize an industry that, quite frankly, is a reluctant partner in the, in the enterprise of biodefense. First of all, I will highlight it depends if you're a big, small, or medium company. Because if you're a big company like the Merck's and the Pfizer's of the world, what matters most to you in the endeavor of biodefense and pandemic protection and preparedness is liability. And quite frankly, one of the major issues that we had to contend with in our bill, the bill that I'll highlight here in just a minute, was the, the notion that liability was the principal, if you will, barrier to getting the entry of companies that have a proven track record in producing vaccines and antiviral drugs. There are a number, there are literally hundreds of small biotech companies and a variety of academic institutions that have very novel ideas, incredibly creative ideas, but fact of the matter is have not produced a product to get to FDA approval. So one of the challenges right up front was trying to, if you will, lower the barrier of entry for companies and we'll talk specifically about some of the liabilities provisions that were created. But if you're a big company as well, you worry about a couple of things that talk about opportunity costs and perceived profitability. I only highlight that Lipitor, which is a drug used to lower your cholesterol, its annual sales is over about $8 billion a year. And when you talk about a one-time sale, if you will, of a biodefense countermeasure, that may be 800 or a billion dollars. I mean, that was the case of smallpox. One dose for every American, you know, you can figure out that quickly and do the math. That that's not a very good economic incentive for these companies. So even though we were able to address some of the liability concerns, the perceived profitability and particularly the opportunity costs uh, are, are significantly uh, involved still. But these large companies are, are not, if you will, cold, hard, and ruthless 
not, so, not always how we portray them, is that they're very concerned about their public image and they're willing to get in, involved in the game, at least partially, if they have the belief that they're not, if you will, betting the company on the process. For small and uh, medium-sized biotechnology, the issue is this issue of capital investment and, if you will, the capacity to do something. They have no profitability, if you will. Many of these companies have one or two potential products, and they would be dying to get their, their billion dollars, their hands out of a billion dollar contract with the US government. But quite frankly, they don't have the money to get there. And again, since they're not a proven, if you will, company that has developed a, a myriad of products like the Mercs, uh, for example, it becomes very difficult for them to get to the finish line. I only highlight this. Uh, to show you one other slide, which is something that matters to all of us, because it has to do with two things that are critical in business and, if you will, in national security, time and money. The way we do drug development, and it's not my purpose here to, to counsel you on other, other than the fact is it takes too long and costs too much. And so if you look at the case of H5N1 bird flu, and realized that it basically emerged in 1996, recognized as highly pathogenic to poultry in Hong Kong, and has evolved ever since to becoming a, a disease that does infect humans with a high morbidity and mortality rate, that even after a number of years of dedicated effort by a variety of individuals since 1996, we still do not have a candidate vaccine. And that's not only a process of the FDA approval cycle, there are scientific issues um, that are involved with this. But if we were to have an emergence of a SARS-like agent, if you recall that event, which again required uh, that in lieu of any kind of vaccine or antiviral drug, required, if you will, is isolation and quarantine, spread rapidly around the world, uh, literally within weeks. And the reality of that is, is that somehow we need a nimble, agile, pharmaceutical base to basically respond to these events. If you will anticipate them on one hand, and the second one is to basically respond to these events rapidly to produce a product that could be used either as emergency use authorization or be well down the line or actually ideally FDA approved. Uh, this is a big chore uh, because culturally and institutionally, we do our business sequentially. And really, that is a focus of both legalistic importance but also as it relates to, uh, if you will, to the practical science and law that are involved. I'll just spend a moment to highlight a couple of things. This is the bill that was introduced and will be reintroduced by Senator Burr here next week. We are hopeful that we'll get it done by May. And hope is, is not a course of action in, the, in Capitol Hill, but I think there is a concerted effort by the administration and by a number of bipartisan senators and potentially House members to move this forward. I'll just spend a moment to talk briefly about the BARDA idea. This is the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Agency. But then spend a little bit of time talking about liability. Clearly, there are other things of, I would say, legal issues or legal interest to you, basically providing antitrust protection for HHS so they can work effectively and rapidly with pharmaceutical companies in anticipation of emergencies or during actual public health emergencies. Um, obviously, if you're interested in tax code, we can talk a little bit about the rebates and grants that would be needed for a domestic uh, surge capacity. By the way, I didn't mention to you that, that about one-third or almost uh, a little over one-third of the smallpox vaccine that we have in our national stockpile today was produced outside the country. So one of the real issues that we have to deal with is the, la the fact that we do not have a domestic capacity to produce any of these products, even if we had the means or, if you will, a viable candidate. Uh, let me just skip ahead of BARDA one second and talk about the specific liability provisions that were actually passed uh, as part of a DOD appropriations bill in December. This was a matter of, of some, uh, I won't say public debate, but some out public outcry uh, by some members of Congress uh, where they called it passing it in the middle of the night, passing it as part of a, of a, a must-pass bill that prevented, if you will, serious debate and consideration of the potential implications. I'm not going to respond to those charges other than to say is liability remains and did remain until this point one of the major 
obstacles to developing a pandemic influenza vaccine, a candidate one, because the principal manufacturers of candidate vaccines, proven track record of influenza vaccine production, uh, actually stipulated that they would not ship any vaccine unless the government gave them full liability for their product, not only for that particular lot, but any for future lots that were uh, produced as a result of their involvement in this industry. Uh, that is obviously a little bit of controversial, but it does highlight the fact that the, the vaccine industry, one that we rely heavily on for public health security and national security now in the 21st century, certainly established clearly early on that liability protections were important. And there were clear limits of liability, and what they provided was, if, if you will, total liability, if you will, an immunity shield that would be, if you will, imposed upon a declaration by the secretary to either a, an anticipated or an actual public health emergency. And this liability or this immunity protected not only the manufacturers, but everyone through the manufacturers to the people who were in the supply chain down, if you will, to the person who either dispensed or administered this product. And this product was not only vaccine, but could involve other products that would be, if you will, not only if you will, not FDA approved, but also FDA approved products. And the only way this immunity shield would be lifted is when there would be death or serious injury that was caused by willful misconduct. Simple negligence and gross negligence were uh, over, if you will, uh, that, that threshold was basically overcome. And I can explain why briefly by saying the, the manufacturers believe that if they were to use their product, and again, in light of a public health emergency, that it would be under the worst circumstances where they would have to rapidly pump out millions, 10 millions doses, actually for the United States, 600 million doses of vaccine, um, and that there could be circumstances where simple negligence or even gross negligence could occur. And again, they wanted some protection for their, for their, uh, for their industry on this. I'm just going to move ahead because I want to leave enough time for questions. Is just highlight what we're planning to do uh, with our second bill, and this is the reauthorization of the Public Health Security Act of 2002. A very uh, diverse bill if you look at it because it originally had to do with public health, medical preparedness, water security, uh, food security, uh, and a variety of things, but our intent is basically focus only on the Title I provisions which deal with public health and, if you will, medical preparedness. Uh, three things of a particular issues that we are concerned about is the public health infrastructure for the 21st century, how we are prepared to deal with the surge, surge, if you will, capacity problems that would be generated by something like a 10 kT or 10 kiloton nuclear detonation or pandemic influenza outbreak, and then the issue of who's in charge in the U.S. government. Um, obviously, that is a, a matter of great concern and outcome of the Katrina event, but clearly has always been muddled at best. A um, couple of things to just highlight uh, briefly what we're trying to draw from. For those who are not familiar with Top Off, that is the top official exercises. There are three of them that were conducted, the first being before 9-11, that have looked at varying scenarios, working with state and local authorities. The last one was in centered around New Jersey and the New York metropolitan area that uh, that basically highlight a number of issues as it relates to our ability to respond to either nuclear or biological event. Obviously, the after actions uh, of reports from Katrina, there have been two so far, a House, if you will, two formal ones from the U.S. government, a House report, a White House report, and the Senate report will come out shortly. And then we're trying to take into account what would be the implications of a possible pandemic of influenza. And again, not to make things less complicated, but is to realize what we have invested in since 9-11 and realize what has worked and what has not. I think Senator Burr was in the state here recently, actually during this week, on Monday was quoted as saying in some of the papers that there's been a lot of money that's been spent, um, a lot of federal money that's been given to state and localities, and some of that money has been highlighted in Los Angeles. We're buying keychains, uh, cup holders, and a variety of other trinkets that had little to do with public health preparedness, uh, but obviously has caused some consternation in Congress as to the, as to the use of some of these monies. 
Uh, what we're intending to do is basically do a couple things from a policy perspective. One is, if you will, to establish that public health is part of our national, national security infrastructure, that there's clearly defined leadership at the federal level, clear lines of authority that are consistent with the National Response Plan, and emergency support function number eight, which has to do with public health and medical response. And then to affirm this issue of all hazard approaches, obviously the original bill, bill was focused on bioterrorism. The world is a little more complex than that. Um, ensure that we do have the appropriate federal oversight and accountability at all levels of government. And, and again, do something that's maybe unusual, not necessarily for Congress, but maybe unusual in terms of some of the some of the preparations that have been up to this point is trying to develop a metrics-based approach. At this, I've kind of given you a whirlwind tour of some of the legislative initiatives we're doing. I would like to be, I'd be very happy in the next 20 minutes to take any and all of your questions. I know I've kind of put a few tantalizing bits out there, uh, but I have, to, uh, uh, I have to admit that I wanted to give you a sense of the, uh, if you will, diversity as well as the complexity of some of the issues that we're trying to deal with as it relates to federal preparedness and realizing that the greatest influence we have with state and localities is not as with law but with money. I'll open up to questions. Sir. Uh, I understand that uh, in areas of uncertainty that the, the risk of unlimited liability looms pretty large in the decision making. But the danger of no liability at all that seems pretty considerable too. Uh, one of the functions of the liability system is to preserve incentives to be careful. And if you get rid of all liability, you get rid of most of those incentives too. Have, have, uh, have you discussed the possibility of, of maybe having some form of uh, intermediate kind of liability where liability is limited to maybe the profits that uh, uh, might be projected from a drug so that the company would at least have a profit margin at stake if not setting the whole company? You know, it's an interesting concept and quite frankly one that wasn't, if you will, widely circulated or entertained during some of these discussions early on. And principally why, principally being is that the position of the companies, and again, this has nothing to do with law, but the practical reality, which was that the companies felt that they needed to have a high degree of immunity to engage in this, particularly on the pandemic problem, where they felt that uh, their exposure would be incredibly great. Now, I can tell you that one of the, not that it's a checks and balance, but one of the things I didn't highlight here were two things. One is that, uh, you know, it's called the FDA defense was incorporated into this that basically left the government the opportunity to, if you will, take action against the companies, vice the individuals, if there would be the violation of FDA regulatory or good manufacturing activities. So there is some, there is some leverage there. I mean, it's, this is not all or none necessarily. But clearly, I think that, you know, given, given the nature of what was developed, that it's not uh, I, I, don't, I wouldn't be surprised if there would be further debates and maybe further legislation that would try to get this a little better. I mean, one of the issues that, quite frankly, that is circulated out there quite a bit, and I didn't highlight it, is that there's a compensation process identified in this bill, uh, or in this particular provision, uh, that basically is based on smallpox compensation as part of the Public, uh, Public uh, Health Service Act that basically provides for, uh, I guess, uh, reimbursement for medical costs, lost wages, uh, and death benefits, does, does nothing for non-economic, you know, pain and suffering kind of losses. Um, but still, pardon me? Out of whose pocket does that come from? Uh, th that would come out of a federal compensation fund. So that doesn't give right. Right. But the, one of the things that, again, one of the pressure points was the FDA regulatory process which would give the government the opportunity to pursue that. I'm sorry, who is? Sure. And, and I think you know, one of the issues that was uh, authorized but not appropriated, so there, there are no funds that, that were basically put against that. Uh, that was a subject of, uh, of, if you will, testimony, actually questioning by Senator Dodd from Connecticut during a hearing that we had with Secretary Levitt last week on the 16th, where it was asked, well, you know, how come we didn't put a nickel towards this? And how come we put so much, you know, effort on or focus on liability and little on compensation? Um, 
and quite frankly, that did come up in our discussions in our in our negotiations. And the reality is, is that it was very hard to conceive how much money you should put into this fund, given that, for a practical purpose, that you didn't know what the potential pathogen was, you didn't know what the countermeasure was, you didn't know what the adverse consequence, you know, profile of that countermeasure was, and you don't know who was afflicted by it. So in some ways, it, it created a, a bunch of uncertainty, particularly in a time, quite frankly, where the budget realities just argued for acknowledging that Congress will act, it always acts. It acted after 9-11, it acted after the swine flu problems in 17, uh, probably 1975, um, that, uh, that money will be put in there when it's needed. Sir. Um, I really appreciated your talk. I was curious if one of the issues is getting corporations in the private sector to do more investing in this, why not? focus more resources and energy on, as you call it, Manhattan Project, perhaps centered within the NIH? Sure. Uh, great question. And that's the uh, kind of like the, the bullet, the first bullet here is, whoops, can you put that slide on? Is basically creating a mechanism to do that and putting a billion dollars towards advanced development. I mean, in, in that linear slide I showed you, there was the valley of death. I didn't talk about it. Uh, let me, maybe I can get back one really quick here. It's this notion that somehow we have not, we have enabled this part of it, the basic R&D. We've enabled a procurement, but we basically have done nothing to basically uh, incentivize the advanced development, which is the greatest threshold problem in some of the areas. And so part of this has been focusing on how we can do that. And part of that is basically, um, uh, if you will, establishing a mechanism, a DARPA-like mechanism in HHS for those who are not familiar with DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, the fellows that truly developed the internet, developed the Saturn missile program, UAVs, they're doing a lot of nanotechnology, but take an approach, a more, more risk accepting approach to the development of drugs that allows the government to be a venture capitalist. And so part of that is, is basically realizing that by doing this, and again, I can show you a, a bit what we think BARDA should look like, a small little organization, properly researched, somewhere between resource somewhere between 500 million and a billion dollars a year, an entrepreneurial culture that is not bureaucratic, that it's not research and development, and basically a streamlined acquisition process that does the things to speed things through, but you know, with a big caveat, that still, if you will, adheres to the FDA regulatory process. Sir. I've got this right. We're going to socialize the development cost. We're going to socialize the compensation. What we're leaving is the actual manufacturing uh, that and profit to the private sector. <laughs> I can see why the drug companies would like that. <laughs> well, yeah, they may. They may. But, but here's the dilemma is that we, we don't know if that's going to be the outcome of all this. Because again, probably the most powerful influence on the entry to this market for the, for the companies that have proven track records the big pharma companies is the opportunity cost that quite frankly and the profitability that make this market something less than enticing. So the reality here, the policy question that we're struggling with is do we need, you know, to add to your socialized approach there, do we need a government-based manufacturing capacity and capability? And, and that is, you know, that is an issue for you know, the next Congress to address. But, but it's one I think is a fair question. Sir. Limiting my question to the terrorism side of this talk here today, I'm getting the distinct feeling that true sophisticated terrorists are in a position to develop bio weapons at a much faster rate than we could possibly countermeasure. And in that scenario, getting the distinct feeling you're, you're trying to throw money at something that's a race we can't win. Well, you know, that, that may be true, but I'll just highlight this. Much of it depends on the strategy you choose in your medical countermeasure development. If you do the one drug, one bug approach, you're right. 
if you look for, and then we call these platform technologies or broad spectrum countermeasures, example would be antibiotics, for example, for which we have a severe problem, irrespective of any terrorists out there, that we're running out of them and the market forces for those products are minimal. Again, they don't make a lot of money. That somehow promoting that kind of development is really what we're trying to do. And, and that's really what, you know, you know, the orphan drug, I didn't talk about it, but the orphan drug or market exclusivity offered is actually kind of an orphan drug approach to incentivize the development of new antimicrobials, specific an specifically antibiotics. But yes, you highlight a, a very critical point in one of, you know, again, in, in, in another area of this very complex problem. Sir. Company profitability. I mean, it seems like in a pure market, people would pay almost any amount for a drug that would cure a disease as part of a pandemic. I mean, I think we saw that with Cipro during the anthrax outbreak. So, is assumed in this model some sort of government constraint on that market in terms of how much you can charge, a drug company could charge for a drug, or how those would be provided to the public? Uh, not in this model. I think that's a practical consideration as it relates to the strategic national stockpile, which would provide these products as a matter of government, you know, if you will, uh, you know, if you will, response to an event. But it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, if you will, address specifically the idea of the potential price gouging that could happen. Very supportive of that. I don't know. <coughs> Sir. When, when you describe the great uncertainty that plagued the question of how much money to appropriate to the compensation fund, I was thinking you know, that's precisely one reason why those of us who teach tort law love the idea of tort liability. It's a sort of market-based regulatory system, if you will, in that it deploys these decentralized private actors to think hard about that question rather than the folks you're working for in Washington. Um, so I was thinking, if, if we're looking for a way to preserve that, um, uh, you know, the, the opportunity cost argument as a disincentive strikes me as that's reaching beyond just the industry structure. That's talking about the whole way we finance healthcare in this country. And Congress created this dilemma through ERISA and, and allowing the creation of these sort of relatively unregulated HMOs. Congress could fix that by just mandating coverage under all ERISA plans for biodefense and pandemic vaccine and drugs, um, which would then create a demand side solution rather than a, pub, a supply side solution, which seems to me um, has come in for a, a rough hearing. And there, are, and there are those who argue for that. OK. <laughs> I'm not alone. <laughs> no, 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 you're not. <laughs> Join me in thanking Dr. If I could leave.